Okay. One, two. Okay, thank you very much for coming. I know it's the uh, end of the day already, so uh, I'll try to get through this quickly so you can get yourself a drink and start uh, starting to go to the pub crawling. <laughs> Socializing. <laughs> but uh, I would try uh, to get through this quickly, as I said, and um, it's great to have full room. Hopefully, this at full attendance uh, reflect the interest of the topic. So today's presenter is myself, Irat Karadinov. I'm OpenStack engineer at CloudOps. CloudOps uh, is a delivery partner of Mirantis in Canada. Today with me I have Alexei Kaladyazhny. He is a senior deployment engineer at Mirantis. And uh, Ivan Kaladyazhny, he is a Cinder um, developer <laughs> at Mirantis as well. Both guys came from Ukraine. And we have with us uh, Christian Yubner. He is a senior uh, system architect at Mirantis. So. Before going to agenda, we would like to ask you a few questions. Is anybody here running the OpenStack in production already and uh, some uh, critical workloads? All right, nice. Look at so many hands. Um, so are you guys, any, any of you are still running on Grizzly or uh, Icehouse or Juno, like all the, all the release of OpenStack? Raise your hands, it's okay. Cool. So the, the rest of the people, I guess, running uh, their clouds on Kilo and Liberty, right? So yeah, uh, but here we are on Summit and we have a new release of OpenStack uh, ready. So question to you guys, um, how many of you are considering to upgrade uh, to the latest release? <laughs> okay, there's one, two, three, okay. I guess everybody wants, right? But uh, as you probably know, um, currently the uh, OpenStack upgrade is work in progress from the community. Uh, most of the vendors actually already have uh, Im implemented upgrades, but they limit it to the one or two uh, small releases, basically. So you cannot really go back to the old release of OpenStack Cloud. And um, there's not, not even a question about if you're going to change your storage backend or um, if you want to change the network architecture, it's basically like a small reference architecture that is supported for the upgrade. So it wouldn't be great if you upgrade your old cloud somehow and get to the latest version. Uh, so the alternative way I want to discuss today is migration. Uh, basically, in migration, you have two clouds side by side. Uh, so you're basically migrating your workloads from one cloud to another. Uh, so for this summit, we actually came with two presentations. Uh, one of them is going to be tomorrow. Uh, we'll just talk about uh, why and how to assess uh, and migrate application, cloud application between OpenStack clouds. But today's presentation would be only kind of focusing on the storage migration between clouds. So the agenda is basically we're going to have quick introduction of storage migration between clouds and OpenStack and between different backends. And we're actually going to deep dive how we implemented uh, those um, different methods uh, of migration between different backends. So we start with the granular migration, and we will go uh, to the like all-in-one kind of migration. And, and finally, I uh, will finish with the uh, native Cinder APIs, which allows to do the volume migration uh, between uh, backends only, because native A Cinder APIs they cannot do the migration between clouds. So I'll pass the mic to Alexei, and he will continue his part. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexey Kolodyazhny, and I will tell you a bit more about the introduction. I will tell you about what's, what is migration, and uh, I will name some main approaches what, uh, how to migrate the data. So what is actually migration? Migration is the transferring of some kind of data from source to destination with appropriate adoption of this data. And the actual data in the cloud, we can divide in two groups. It can be the configuration part, which includes user data, uh, user information, tenants, networks, uh, security groups, and so on, and the actual data. And in this presentation, we will talk about this actual data, which actually includes ephemerals, images, shares, and volumes, everything that can be stored on the storage backend. And I want to note that uh, migration can be done inside the cloud, between the cloud, and between the backends. And we will talk about this in our presentation. So uh, why are we migrating? There could be a lot of different ways that uh, brings us to the idea of migration. And uh, first of all, it can become because the cloud upgrades. Uh, unfortunately, in place upgrades is currently not available, uh, and uh, the Alternative for the in-place upgrade can be uh, 
creating a, par a parallel uh, control plane and migrating the workloads from source to destination cloud. And disaster recovery, when it comes to, uh, something went wrong and you have to uh, migrate back from some disaster storage your workloads uh, back to operating cloud. And instant, mi instance migration, when uh, you have to migrate some instances and volumes between tenants, users, or clouds. And actually the benefits, what migration gives to us is uh, the no vendor lock-in because you can migrate between different storage backends and actually the flexibility which is very important in business. So the main expectations uh, that we give to migration is minimal downtime. So we have to make the downtime near, nearly to the zero downtime. Uh, data consistency, we have to look after our, our data and not leave, left something behind. Reliability, we have to have plan B. And magic, because actually migration is not the easy thing and there are a lot of uh, business logic covered under the hood. And actually the difficulties, the main difficulty may become uh, from the network because it's maybe the main bottleneck for the migration. Uh, also, that data is currently in use and we have to deal with it when the users should not notice that we're working and migrating their data. And uh, maybe last but not least, that uh, application which customers want to migrate are not usually ready for clouds and we have to deal with legacy applications. So let's get closer to the uh, approaches. And the first approaches I want to describe is low-level migration. Uh, this is a part of the group of approaches which is uh, named granular migration when we are working with each volume. And uh, the main idea is when you have the volume, it's presented like the uh, block device or Ceph RBD device. Uh, you're mounting this device somewhere and on the destination side you create in the same, uh, the similar volume with the same size and also mounting the block device on the destination side and then you are making a transferring of the data using some tool like DD. Uh, the pluses of this approach is that it's quite simple and you can automate it easily and also it gives exact copy of the, of the volume. But also it has some cons like that uh, you have to copy hold the block device because you are not dealing with the files and you don't uh, know how much uh, uh, size is actually used. So you, for example, if the volume takes two terabytes, you have to copy whole two terabytes. And also this approach is very slow, so you cannot apply it for all volumes because, because it will take ages. So the next uh, approach is uh, a bit more high level. In this approach, we work with file system. And for example, imagine that you have some volume and you already have some file system on this volume. Uh, you can mount this file system somewhere, for example, on some node of the uh, cloud, or you can create some operational VM and uh, access this volume from this operational VM. The same thing you're doing on the destination cloud, you're creating the volume with the same size, uh, you're creating the file system and you're mounting it, and then you're making a copy of the data from uh, between these mount points. Using rsync, SCP, doesn't matter. The pros of this uh, approach is that uh, you can copy, copy only user data, so you're dealing with files, and for example, if there's two terabytes volume you, and only 20 ter uh, gigabytes uh, is used, you're copying only this actual data. And the cons is that it's quite hard to automate because you are not sure and you have to predict what file system will be allocated in this volume. The next approach is the backend replication. Uh, this is the part of the group of, of uh, approaches which can be named like one-shot migration. And the main idea is that you have some uh, backend attached to the cloud and you can uh, attach the similar backend on the destination site and make a replication of the data between the storage backends using native replication. The pros is that you can transfer all volume in one set, but also this is a cons because you cannot make a granularity and you cannot migrate, for example, only volumes for this particular user or particular tenant. You have to migrate everything in one set. Also, it uh, brings a vendor lock-in because you can replicate only uh, between the uh, same storage types, storage type backends, 
and the, it uh, costs us additionally because you have to uh, pay for additional hardware on the destination site and maybe additional license fee. And last but not the least approach is the backend uh, reusage. In this case, you will use the same backend on the source and destination. You will access it simultaneously from both sides. So it gives us uh, pluses like, first of all, you don't need to transfer data. You will not uh, lose time on it. You don't have to pay for additional hardware and for additional uh, licenses. You're just reusing the storage. And actually the cons, uh, they can appear only uh, because of some particular uh, realization of this approach. Uh, in more details, all of this approach will be described in further, and uh, I'm, I would like to give the microphone back to Irat, and he will tell you more about the granular uh, migration. All right, thanks, Alexei. I'll try to make the ball rolling. So, um, basically, Alexei covered already all the nuts and bolts of the migration between clouds. Uh, so uh, the approaches that Alexei covered have uh, been implemented in the migration tooling that actually Marant has been using for several years already uh, and offering to customers who wants to basically upgrade their clouds. Um, so, and definitely th those uh, migrations have been used where the upgrade was not feasible. Uh, so creation of this automation tooling uh, involved a lot of magic. So uh, today we want to share with you how this magic has been done basically. Uh, as you know, OpenStack has um, many backends. Uh, I think 70 plus backends now. Uh, so it's a great thing for having, of course. Uh, but when it goes to migration, it's actually kind of a hard, hard pain for us because you need to consider you might have any different backends to migrate. So uh, when we're building uh, our migration tooling, we basically had to think about how to make this process more general so we can reapply it to another backends. So uh, actually, for this presentation, we uh, prepared uh, the iSCSI, Fiber Channel, NFS, and Ceph uh, type of migration. So I will start with NFS tab backends. NFS uh, tab backends basically the, 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 the simplest to migrate because basically you have your volume presented on the file system basically as a file. So we basically need to migrate uh, the, the, the Cinder uh, metadata and then transfer the file from source to destination. Before going to explain, I'll just quickly remind how NFS type backends work in the example of creation uh, Cinder volume. So, uh, so we have our controller node uh, and NetApp NFS server, uh, which is basically uh, they communicated through the uh, NetApp Direct 7 mode driver. Uh, we have an app here because we just recently used it for our migration, so it's still fresh in my mind. And uh, basically, when the when you create a volume, uh, the volume would be created uh, in the NFS share. And if you want to attach this uh, volume to your VM node, uh, basically the the, fi the file system will be mounted on the compute, and then that's how it's going to work. So uh, important configuration would be to have NFS mount point base, and you, you, you can also have several shares attached or several NetApp servers attached to the same controller, and the, the shares config under the shares.com file. So if everything configured correctly, you will see on your controller node the, the two, in our case, two uh, file system attached, and the shares are MNT Cinder volumes. So when you create your uh, volumes, you basically, in our case, is test and test 10 with the sizes. You would actually see those volumes created under MNT Cinder volumes. So we basically need to transfer this metadata and transfer the volume to the destination. So here we have two clouds controller uh, node, which is running on Grizzly, and here uh, the Mitaka, the latest release. So. As you know, Cinder APIs cannot create volumes on a, on a different cloud, so we had to use the migration tool in between. Here it's deployed on the controller node. So the first step of migration would be actually to migrate the, uh, the users and tenants so they would be available on destination. And, uh, and the Cinder volume migration starts with the migration of quarters. If you want to migrate them, this is optional. And then uh, you would find this volume on the source cloud, 
uh, create exactly the same volume on the destination with the Cinder API call. Uh, with this, basically, the volume would be with the same name and with the same size. And then basically, you just need to transfer the file from source to destination. So we just had to automate this process uh, in order to make this for transferring many volumes. But uh, it's, it's very slow, so uh, the way to make it faster a little bit, we basically made uh, parallel, parallel migration and we used more advanced transfer protocols. So in, we found a protocol called BBCP, which uh, uses uh, bandwidth most, more efficiently than SCP or rsync commands. So I hope this is clear, it's very simple. Uh, so things are rolling now. Uh, now we're moving to the block level type backend. So uh, here we have iSCSI and FC channel. Uh, this is more complex to automate and to, to perform migration because the volume is a block device. So you need to find the way how to mount this block device on the controller. So again, uh, we just recently worked with the VMAX driver. Uh, so I have some, some fresh in mind. And basically, I want to show how just basically create a volume uh, on, on OpenStack. And, and from there, we can ba basically show how to do the migration itself. So uh, we have a controller node and the VMAX. And the communication between controller and node goes through the SMIS uh, solution enabler. Uh, this is kind of a server in between which uh, has installed APIs which can talk to the VMAX. So when you create a vol send a create volume command, uh, it will use WMAX WBAM API and create a VMAX volume and it will land on the default storage group. This is like for the specifically for the VMAX driver. Uh, it can be actually configured in a fast pool as well. In our case, it was fast pool, so we put it there. So if you want to attach this volume to the destination cloud, you would basically uh, need to create a, uh, what's always happens, the, the volume is kind of transferred from the default storage group to the instant storage group. And then you need to create a masking view. This is basically uh, the way to uh, create view for this block device so it can be seen on the compute node. And then you, you're running the rescan, and then you basically can attach the volume to compute node uh, over SCSI. So we need to work with this uh, block device basically in order to do the migration. So now we can show how we did migration. And uh, this implementation actually a little bit more compli com complex because we have on the one side we have NFS share type and uh, on the destination we have uh, VMAX iSCSI. So to do the migration the same way, uh, we would need to check to find the volume we're migrating on the source cloud, create exactly the same volume on the destination cloud, and it, it will go to this uh, default storage group, right? So the next step would be actually the magic, or how to call it. Uh, basically, we need to do the backwards engineering in order to understand how the VMAX driver works. And instead of attaching to the compute node, we attach the uh, block device to the controller, because our migration tool is landed there. <coughs> So once that's done, you can basically do uh, block by block transfer from source cloud to destination. So I, I think it's clear. But once things are automated, it's working well. But again, this is very slow. So it can be only used for the groups of volumes or like very critical workloads which you want to migrate. So finally, the Ceph type backends, the migration work in the exact same way. The idea is the same. Uh, the only difference here, the commands you're using. So instead of block by block transfer, you would use RBD export diff to RBD import diff. Uh, with the RBD export, uh, you can actually transfer not whole volume, but actually the uh, the the exact data inside of the volume. So the mi the migration is faster here. And if you want to transfer from block to Ceph, you would use RBD import. And if you do the from Ceph to block, you would use RBD export. So. So now, uh, as I said, these methods are very slow. And uh, my colleague, Christian, would uh, actually cover how you can do the migration in a one shot. Christian, please. OK, thank you, Arad. So in many cases, when you do migration, uh, you do not want to actually see, have your um, users, tenants, see that you are doing migration even. So the idea is instead of using OpenStack mechanism to use uh, the built-in mechanisms in uh, a host of storage backends, one of them would be 
uh, Ceph uh, RBD implement incremental replication, NetApp has their uh, snap mirror, EMC has mirror view, and a number, a number of other backends also have this built in. So uh, the other uh, approach that I would like to discuss is why do we migrate the data at all? The problem is if you have a three, four, five petabyte store and you're trying to push all those bits through the, through the network, you'll find that first of all you have uh, impact on your performance because uh, uh, hard disks have only a, a relatively limited capability of doing uh, multiple tasks. They, they, I mean, a, a standard eight terabyte uh, um, spinning hard disk gives you 100 IOPS if you're lucky. And uh, the other thing is that you uh, normally you, you don't want to uh, clog your network, the, the production network, with data that is uh, being pushed through. So the approach that we are currently working on is why migrate the data at all? Take the backend, attach it to the new cloud, migrate the Cinder entries from here to there, and then uh, Use, reuse, or keep uh, keep using the backend with the new cloud. So replication within backends, the, of course, you have performance impact. Uh, in many cases, it's possible to throttle that. NetApp has a mechanism to throttle that. EMC has a mechanism to throttle that. Uh, but you will still notice the impact. You will notice, especially if you are running your storage array not only at twenty percent, which in, Everyone in the room probably knows that this is not something that normally happens. You have a storage array that's running at 60, 70% capacity, and if you add on the capacity that's necessary to push all the data into the new uh, cloud, then uh, you will have uh, some performance impact. So uh, the idea is to get the delta within a couple minutes. In the snap mirror, usually my uh, experience is that you have maybe two minutes that you can uh, get it down to, no, there's no way to get it down far, uh, faster, farther because uh, the data comes in as fast as you can write it. And uh, during the final sync, so basically you have to shut it down, shut all your uh, applications down, and this is a one shot, so you have to shut all, uh, down all your applications at the same time. And then you have to uh, migrate this in the database and start up the applications with the target storage. So only, obviously, it's only applicable to uh, whole data pools. You cannot just do that with individual volumes. And it may not work with all backends. And the downtime is going to be measured probably in 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, depending on how well it's automated. So here's a number of replication mechanisms. As we are going to share the slide deck, I'm not going to read them out loud. And I'll proceed to why migrate at all. So, this is um, uses Ceph as an example, but it would work with most of the other storage backends too. The idea is to have the backend attached to the old cloud. You have the old cloud right here. And you, then you do the attachment to the new cloud. And we are currently working on a mechanism how to, to the, how to automate the attachment to the new cloud so you can actually just uh, tell Mirantis OpenStack during deployment that you want the new cloud attached to the same Ceph backend. And then the only thing that you actually have to migrate, and it is minute by comparison, is that Cinder database. So uh, the, the other big advantage of this is that as your data stays in place, you can do the migration uh, volume by volume. You can just say, OK, this volume is currently in my old Cinder database. I take out the entry, put it in the new Cinder database, and fire up the uh, application in the new Cinder database. And you can do that over days or weeks. It doesn't really matter because the data is not actually moving anywhere. So we are currently working on this. Uh, on this plugin, it is already functional, and uh, if somebody is interested in what it looks like, I have a, a, um, a brown bag talk tomorrow, where I describe uh, attachment of Ceph to multiple clouds, not for the purpose of migration, but for the purpose of actually running more than one cloud with uh, one Ceph back and to take advantage of the economy of scale. And 
The downside to that, of course, is the storage networks of the clouds must be connected. If you're a major bank and you have your production system and you have a test system, you probably do not want to share a self cluster between them. But in many cases, uh, this is uh, an acceptable uh, drawback, especially if it's uh, done for migration and you only use it uh, like this for a few hours, a few days uh, at the maximum. And ob obviously, as this is uh, still uh, under development, there are going to be a couple of bugs, and we would much appreciate if somebody finds one, uh, if, uh, if you actually tell us about it. So, and of course, Seth has its name from cephalopods, so I put the cephalopod in there. And the, uh, the final point is you take advantage of the economy of scale. If you do more than one uh, cloud with one Ceph cluster, that's a, that's a pretty important thing because a lot of people try to, to run three, three, four, five node Ceph clusters and find out that they are not quite as stable and not quite as fast as, uh, as one would think. So, we have discussed all kinds of migration from cloud A to cloud B, but we oftentimes also have the need to migrate within one cloud. And uh, Ivan is going to discuss with us how we can do, with the native Cinder API, we can do this migration within one cloud. Thank you, Christian. As you may know, Cinder have several APIs to migrate your data from one storage to another. Cinder use the same approaches like Alexei mentioned earlier. So I mentioned such APIs like migrate, backup, replication, and few words about retype, because retype sometimes will call migration. So let's start with, uh, with migration. Um, Cinder uh, can migrate volume in two different approaches. The first approach is very fast and simple. If backend storage and Cinder driver supports direct migration between two back backends, the data will be transferred directly. Uh, this approach is unfortunately is, sub is supported only about 10 drivers in Cinder and Metaka, and usually you could migrate your data from the same type of backend. For example, from NetApp to NetApp, from pure storage to pure storage, Touch and so on, but this approach is very fast. The second Cinder approach is host assisted migration, and it works for any supported Cinder backends. In, in this kind of migration, Cinder will attach source volume destination volume to Cinder node and copy all data using DD command. This is could be very slow, especially when you got big volumes but it works for any backend. For example, you can migrate your volumes from iSCSI to fiber channel or iSCSI to NFS or CF. In Cinder, we call this approach generic volume migration. And retype. As I mentioned earlier, retype can cause mic volume migrations. Let's discuss what is volume time from Cinder point of view and why retype will call migration. So from Cinder point of view, volume type is just a set of labels, set of volume definitions. For example, you can map volume type to specified backend and all your volumes will be created to, on SSD or HDD storages. Oh. Volume extra specs is more granular def st storage definitions. It could be storage specific like QoS or special when the defined it properties for your storages. So when you will call, call retype, for example, you've got HDD storage with tape A and SDD storage with type B. And you have to call Cinder type command to move your data. 
uh, don't forget to mention migration policy on demand because if you want to migrate, for, in our case, from HDD to SSD and without migration policy on demand, since they won't migrate your data. Because the type works very simple. Since they will check volume type contents, if it is the same, it's nothing to do except the change database record. If contents are different, since they will call, call the driver to make a type. And if the driver does not have imp open implementation, it will call migration API. So for this case, migration policy options are very important. Because in now in Metaka, without this option, you don't see why it doesn't migrate. The other important note is that migration is only ad admin operation. Of course, you can set up permission in po policy JSON, but it's not recommended to use it to make immigrations. So w once you get immigrate, once you do a migration, the user does not know about it. They don't have permission to view migration progress, or they actually see available volumes. I will not cover migration for in used volumes or live migration because uh, Alex mentioned it in the previous session and you can see it in the video. The next backups. Oh, you can also use Syndra backup service to migrate data between storages. It's very simple. You have original volumes, create backup, and restore volume. From so the point of view, backup is full copy of volume, so it's easy to migrate data. But we've got several limitations in Cinder. It's about only six supported backup backend. The newest one is Google Cloud Storage. It was introduced in Metaka. But once you've got a backup in one of these storages, you can restore volume to any supported backend in your cloud. So you can get backups in Google or Swift or Ceph and restore it to LVM, NFS, NetApp, Solidfire, and so on. It could be extremely slow, but usually, if you've got a backup, users don't, users don't work with it. So it does not matter. That's all about the APIs. You can ask any questions after speech. Christian. Okay, thank you very much, Ivan. This was uh, very informative. And uh, I would like to wrap up, oh. And the application. It was a very good talk about application in the previous session, so I almost forget about it. <laughs> Ed, thank you very much for the, your talk. Uh, application is mo more about disaster recovery, not about migration. As mentioned before, it, we introduced application V2.1 cheesecake, and in Newton it will be tiramisu. So if you need to disaster recovery application, makes sense, but it's not about migration data. No, that's all. <laughs> okay, so I'll uh, go uh, through the summary very quick. One thing to keep in mind is that replication is nothing to be trifled with. Uh, you have valuable data, you have, uh, you have performance requirements, you have SLAs, and uh, if it's not well planned, uh, it's a recipe for disaster. And ob ob obviously moving data is uh, bound by physics. Uh, a petabyte of data does not flow by itself. It does, it does not flow uh, quickly by itself. We have uh, presented a set of met methods, granular migration, all-in-one migration, migration between backends, and migration within one cloud. And in many cases, you will find uh, that uh, a combination is the uh, uh, best choice. For instance, you uh, mi migrate with uh, keeping a self cluster in place. And you go uh, at, at the end of the migration, you will want to add a solid fire array or something and just migrate volumes inside the cloud from the from the Ceph backend to the solid fire. So uh, I'm 
Uh, thank you very much for staying with us, even so uh, the booth crawl has probably already begun. And, <laughs> and uh, for all your application backends, I sincerely wish, wish you success. Uh, this is, it's, uh, on one hand, it's not uh, easy, but on the other hand, doing it right and finding out uh, everything has worked and your customers are happy, that's uh, the real reward. And please feel free to ask questions. We are going to be here a few more minutes, and uh, even though we are uh, technically at time, but uh, I would appreciate being able to uh, clar clarify a few things. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Enjoy the summit. Any question? Everybody wants a beer. <laughs> Everybody wants a beer, yes. You guys know the pop crawl? I have one quick question. Yes? Uh, unfortunately, you, as a user or administrator, you have not any option to view why it fails, only view logs. In Newton, there will be a new API in the user facing messages. Um, migration within backends can be inside one cloud or it can be between clouds. Uh, it's, for instance, you have one cloud that has a NetApp as a backend and one cloud that has, uh, let's say, an EMC as a backend, uh, and you want to migrate between those clouds either direction, uh, then it's mi uh, migration between backends and between clouds. But you could have, for instance, you could have tiers, performance tiers in one cloud. You have a, a, um, whatever s a spinning storage device and whatever s uh, SSD storage device, and you find out that uh, a certain instance uh, is starved in, ter in terms of IOPS. So you take the instance or the, the volume that's attached to that instance and migrate it inside the cloud between tiers so that uh, they are uh, basically orthogonal to each other. They can exist both uh, together or both apart from each other. The reattach option would still work. Um, you could, um, for instance, say, okay, I'm going from a hyperconverged to a non-hyperconverged <laughs> setup. Um, I'm just leaving the OSDs from uh, on Ceph uh, on my um, on the nodes that they are currently on, but migrate the compute services into a new cloud. And uh, so basically, instead of uh, migrating um, from one server to, uh, to another, I, I take the services off and put them onto a server uh, that is separate from each other. But uh, hyperconverged to hyperconverged, obviously, it does not work for obvious reasons. With, uh, it does not work with reattach uh, for uh, with uh, for obvious reasons. In this case, it would hyperconverge to hyperconverge. You, you would go and use the uh, backend replication method, pro most probably. So the question the is basically, he's asking uh, if we can migrate and would it be matter if uh, the volumes we're transferring, if, if they're encrypted, uh, would that impact? So Christian, you want to answer? Yes, it does. Uh, uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, if you have, uh, if you do something like a snap mirror, it doesn't matter whether the data is encrypted. You get an exact identical image on the new NetApp uh, that you had on the old NetApp. If you go from 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 backend to backend, obviously you have to be, have the decryption key so you can actually get at the data and uh, uh, shuttle it over to the other uh, device. Right. So uh, it uh, really depends on the methodology. And, and if, for instance, uh, if you don't have the uh, decryption key, but we want to uh, migrate from here to there, um, a backend re replication is oftentimes not the worst thing to do. All right, guys. Thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the summit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.